How can, how can somebody be prophetic in this particular age? In part because it feels as though things are accelerating and the logic of the sexual revolution is accelerating. And so um, it almost is like people can't even comprehend one thing and then that's old news and we're on to a new thing. It's totally true. How can, how can somebody be prophetic in that sort of context? You know, I, I think that one of the things I think about a lot is something that uh, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, the future Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, said uh, back in, in the 90s, I think it was. He said that the greatest arguments the church has for itself are not the propositions, um, the apologetic propositions, but the art the church creates and the, the saints. What he was trying to say there is that when we incarnate the faith in the things we make, not just art per se, but just the worlds we build for ourselves and in the way we live our lives, uh, we reach people who are, whose uh, minds are closed to propositional arguments. And that's the modern world. I mean, I don't know uh, the last time you tried to sit down and argue somebody into the faith was, it didn't, ha it didn't happen with me. I came to Christ, first of all, by walking into the cathedral in Chartres in France when I was 17, didn't know where I was going. I saw the glory of God there and nothing had prepared me for it. Mm -hmm. And it made me realize, son of a gun, God is real. And he's not only real, but he wants me. That began my journey to Christ, just being shocked by the wonder of this temple built to the glory of God. The thing that finally tipped me over came a few years later when I met this elderly Catholic priest. I'm not a Catholic, but a Catholic priest who had, had, a, had been an atheist. His parents sent him to America from Guatemala to study at Yale. He lost his faith at Yale, but didn't dare tell his family. Uh, but he went back home to Guatemala City for a, a mass. His elderly father was away from the church and wanted to come back. He, th this old priest, Carlos Sanchez, told me he knelt down to receive communion. He didn't believe it was really the body and blood of Christ. Priest held it out. It was a blast of light that came out of the host. And he heard an audible voice say, I have always loved you. Wow. He was instantly reconverted. Now, this old man was telling me this story in the 1990s, like 92, uh, when I was a young reporter. And he started to cry. These things had happened 50, 60 years earlier. He started to cry as if it had happened last week. I, and he eventually gave his life to Christ and even became a priest. I knew sitting in front of this peaceful old man, this old man who had the peace that passes all understanding, I knew he had met the Lord and I knew that I needed the Lord. So uh, it was fascinating. Those two encounters were what opened my mind up to reading apologetics. So that's kind of a long-winded way to say that the best way we can be, we can li live today to reach others, I think, is to live in a countercultural way, not be flashy about it, but show uh, an example to other people by the example of our lives and the things we create in our lives of what it means to belong to Christ. Uh, because that is a thing that's going to get people. Uh, Benedict the Sixteenth. it's funny, I'm not Catholic, but I keep quoting these Catholics, uh, but I love Benedict the Sixteenth. He said in 1969, Father Ratzinger did, that the day is going to come when all of the power and the glory falls away from the church. The church loses all its riches. Uh, people will leave the church. There will be remaining only a small remnant of true believers but who are know why they're there and know who the Lord is. But these true believers will be the seeds from which the church is reborn. Because, said Father Ratzinger, the world will see them as having something special. A world that has grown unbelievably cold and dark and lonely will see these Christians as having something precious and they're going to want it. I think that we are starting, I know that we're starting to live in that world now. So the thing that we can do best of all as Christians is live our faith boldly, uncompromisingly, and even being willing to suffer if it comes to it. You know, one of the things, I, the, probably the main thing I talk about in Live Not By Lies is the importance of suffering mm -hmm. to, the Christian, to Christian witness. This was the key to surviving communism, according to Christians I interviewed in the former Soviet bloc countries who stayed behind. Um, every one of them said that go back to America and tell the church that if you're not prepared to suffer for the faith, you're done. And um, what, it, what it means is that when people see that we are willing to endure loss of uh, freedom, loss of our jobs, even 
at worst, loss of our lives for the sake of the gospel. That is a testimony. Václav Havel, the first president of a free Czechoslovakia, he was not a Christian, but he wrote in 1977 a famous essay called The Power of the Powerless, What the Powerless Can Do Under Totalitarianism. He invented this story, a parable of the greengrocer. Havel's greengrocer lives in a communist city, and like all the other small business owners, he puts a sign in his window with the Marxist slogan, workers of the world, unite. Mm -hmm. Nobody believes it, they just put it there to avoid trouble. Well, one day, the greengrocer takes the sign down. What happens to him? Well, the secret police come. They arrest him, he loses his business, he loses all his privileges, his family suffers. There is a huge price to be paid for living in truth. But what has he gained? Havel, again, not a Christian, Havel said that, that the greengrocer, by being willing to suffer for the truth, he has shown the world that it is possible to live in truth if you prepare to suffer for it. And by doing that, he will draw more men and women of goodwill to him, and they'll do the same thing. And eventually, the system built on lies will fall. Or from a Christian point of view, uh, we know that it's not just a tactical matter of this is how you bring the government down, but we know that we are called to carry our cross. This is what it means to be a Christian. We can't expect anything else. But today, we look back to the martyrs and confessors of the church, those who testified even when it cost them their life, those are our heroes. We need to rediscover what they had. And that, that is, I think, the strongest way we can resist the soft totalitarianism, which is built on comfort. You know, it, it's, it's strange. I, uh, when I was in Budapest in Hungary doing research for the book, my translator was a young Hungarian Catholic woman. She was pregnant, I remember that, pregnant. She had a little boy at home, and she, her, she and her husband had been married for like five years. And she told me on a tram one day, she goes, you know, it's so difficult, even with my Christian friends here, because when I tell them that my husband and I are struggling, or boy, I'm so exhausted raising our little boy, they tell me, oh, get a divorce, or put your son in daycare, you've gotta be happy, you do you. She said, I keep telling them, wait, I am happy, I'm happily married, I love being a mom, but life is not always easy. She said, they can't comprehend that. To them, anything, even inconvenience, is intolerable suffering, and we have to rearrange the whole world so we can avoid that. I looked at her and said, Anna, it sounds like you're fighting for your right to be unhappy. She goes, that's it, that's what I'm doing. Where did you get that? Well, I pulled my phone out and went to chapter 17 of Aldous Huxley's novel, Brave New World. You know, the two dystopian novels of the 20th century in English were George Orwell's 1984 and Huxley's Brave New World. A lot of us think totalitarianism is Orwell, and that's what it was in the 20th century. But we're building a totalitarianism like Huxley's, yeah. which was a totalitarianism that depended on people's, satisfying people's need for comfort and entertainment yeah. at the expense of their liberty. That's what we're dealing with. And all of these young people who are friends of my translator, because they can't bear inconvenience or any kind of suffering, they're prepared to sacrifice all their liberty to the state or whoever else is gonna take care of that.